Hello, everybody, and welcome to Talking Language AI, where we hold uh, talks and conversations about NLP uh, topics, tools, and people. Uh, my guest today, I'm really excited to be uh, hosting uh, Dr. Hima Lakaraju, professor at Harvard Business School, focused on explainability, fairness, and robustness of machine learning models. These are all very interesting topics as we see AI and machine learning being used more and more in a lot of different systems and a lot of different companies and products. Um, Hima also has been working on various with uh, various domain experts in, in policy and healthcare to understand real world implications uh, of explainable and fair uh, machine learning. Um, so without further ado, it's my uh, honor and pleasure to uh, introduce Hima. Hima, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank Thanks for having me. Super excited. Amazing. All right. I'll uh, hand it over um, to you. Uh, really excited to see what you've uh, been preparing for us. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time to join today. Uh, I'm going to start by sharing my slides and we can get started from there. Hopefully everyone can see this. All right. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit, I guess, as the talk description already says, about interpretability slash explainability. We are going to talk about those terms as well. And, you know, if, if there is any sort of like terminological usage associated with them and so on through the talk. But we are going to broadly discuss about uh, understanding machine learning models and also about novel interfaces that can help us more easily understand these kinds of models, right? So that, those will be the broad themes of today's talk. Uh, so just to sort of set the agenda, I'm going to start off with a simpler introduction to this topic of understanding models. Uh, we are going to look at some of the core approaches in this area and then go to some of our recent research on uh, sort of figuring out what existing or state-of-the-art methods in this area are doing and how they relate to each other. And then we will, uh, in the second part of the talk, we will cover more details about natural language interfaces for understanding models, right? So that will be the agenda for the talk. Okay. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to uh, kick in the motivation for this topic and why we all need to care about understanding machine learning models first and then going to other details. Uh, and Jay, feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions on the chat and I can also take questions during the talk. Wonderful. Well done. Thank you. All right. Great. Okay. So I'm going to start this talk with the sort of, let's call it a hypothesis, because obviously it's trying to make uh, you know, a point that model understanding is absolutely critical in various domains, particularly those that involve high stakes decisions. For example, domains such as healthcare or finance, uh, where, for example, doctors are making decisions about disease diagnosis and treatment recommendations, or banks are making decisions about which individuals loan applications should be approved and which ones should be denied right so machine learning models have found a lot of applications in these kinds of critical decision making and i'm going to start this talk with the hypothesis that model understanding can be very critical in these kinds of settings and decision making scenarios right uh, hopefully, by the time we get to some of the more technical parts of the talk, I would have convinced you that there is, if not absolutely critical, there is a lot of value add for us to understand models when we are employing them in these kinds of decision making scenarios. Okay. Uh, so let's start with some simple examples to see what we even mean by model understanding and how it can be helpful in a few different scenarios, right? Uh, so here is a scenario where, let's say there is a predictive model, which takes as input some images and it uh, classifies them into different animal categories based on what animal is present in that image, right? So in this case, we see an input image of a Siberian Husky, and this model is, in fact, correctly classifying this image as Siberian Husky. So far, everything seems great, right? But if we probe this a little bit more deeply, Deeply. And if somehow we were able to see what are the parts of the image that the model is looking at when making this prediction, 
then we might have more insight into if the model is really doing or looking at the right things when making its predictions, right? So in this case, what we see is that the model is in fact looking at the snow in the image in order to make this prediction, which means what we have built is a snow detector and not really a husky detector or an animal classifier in this case. So the model is using spurious features or incorrect features in order to make this prediction, which means even if on your current data set, your model might be showing reasonable accuracy, if you deploy it in a real world application, uh, you know, out there with like, let's say all the images on the internet being inputs to such a model, then it's going to be inaccurate, right? Because essentially it's looking for snow in images and trying to uh, label animals based on that. So in this case, model understanding is helping us with debugging. And this is a use case that I'm sure several of us can relate to as model developers and engineers and scientists, where understanding model behavior is helping us figure out what is wrong with our models and now you know is asking us or in this case telling us to go and fix something in our training data or in the model training process itself in order to make sure the model is looking at the right features right even though this example is not precisely from like a healthcare scenario or like a financial scenario or you know banks and lending scenarios it can still help us understand the value as just people who are used to building models uh, and developing them okay uh, now let's take a second example where let's say there is a predictive model that is being used to predict if a defendant is too risky to release on bail uh, again, there are, before I go any further, I just want to flag that there are lots of ethical issues with using models like these in order to predict how risky somebody is for different, you know, things and so on. Uh, but that said, there have also been such pre-trial risk assessment tools in the past, including the very famous or the infamous Compass, uh, you know, data set and uh, the tool developed using that. Uh, that uh, the courts and judicial systems have used in the past in order to assess the risk associated with releasing someone on bail, right? I just want to highlight how explanations or model understanding can help us mitigate some of the risks associated with these kinds of tools, right? So for example, let's say there is a predictive model which ingests defendant details, for example, their demographics, their past criminal records, and so on, uh, and makes a prediction of if that defendant is risky to release or not. Uh, so if the judge just looks at this kind of a prediction, there is very little that they can know or understand how much to rely on this prediction, right? So they just see a prediction, they don't know what to do with it, how much to trust it. But if we were to provide them a deeper understanding of, for example, let's say the top three features that are driving this prediction, then they'll be able to figure out if and how much to rely on such a prediction, right? So in this case, the top three features are turning out to be race, gender, and past crimes. Uh, and when a judge looks at this, he or she can easily say that uh, the model is relying on features such as race and gender, which are protected attributes and should not be used in predictions like these. And therefore, they cannot rely on this model's prediction and they need to make their own decision in this case, right? So in this case, uh, model understanding has helped the judge figure out uh, or at least see what are the biases that are involved in the model and if the model is using the right kinds of features when making the predictions, right? Uh, and similarly, if we were to think about a, a scenario in healthcare where a doctor is looking at a bunch of predictions output by a predictive model, again, the question is uh, she does not really know which one's to trust and which ones to rely on and which ones to not trust and make her own decisions on. In this case, if someone were to provide her with like a global understanding of what this model is doing, for example, in this case, uh, if the gender is female, the model is relying on ID numbers to determine who is sick. And if the gender is male, the model is relying on symptoms such as cold and cough to determine who is sick. Uh, looking at such an understanding will tell the doctor that while the model's 
seems to be uh, looking at the right kinds of features. In the case of male patients, the same is not true for female patients, so I should not trust the model on the female patients, right? If a similar understanding was available for, you know, a regulatory authority, uh, which determines if a model is ready to be deployed at a broader scale, then looking at this, they can determine that, well, the model is using irrelevant features on at least, you know, half or close to half of the population. So it's not ready for broader deployment yet, right? So in this case, model understanding is helping us wet models to determine if they're suitable for deployment in the real world, okay? All right. So it seems like there are lots of use cases that we already discussed in just a handful of examples. For example, debugging, bias detection, you know, if and when to trust model predictions, wetting models to assess suitability for deployment, and in the process, model understanding can serve a variety of st stakeholders such as end users, you know, who are at the receiving end of model predictions, decision makers such as doctors and judges, regulatory agencies, and researchers and engineers, right? So there are a wide variety of stakeholders and use cases that model understanding can help with, okay? So hopefully with these examples and some of this motivation, uh, I convinced you to some degree that there is some value to model understanding and especially in scenarios where important decisions are being made. With that context in mind, the next logical question for us to ask is, okay, so now that we all, sort of agree that model understanding is important, how do we go about achieving that, right? So I'm going to start with two very broad, high-level intuitive approaches to achieving model understanding, and then I'll go into more and more details uh, and more recent research, right? So one of the sort of earliest approaches of thinking about how to achieve model understanding is to build models that are inherently interpretable. And what do I mean by that is models that are simple enough that we can all probably pin, print on a sheet of paper and look at them and see what the model is doing, right? So for example, models like linear regression, logistic regression, shallow decision trees, rule-based models with fewer rules and so on. So, and in the past, there has been a lot of work. Uh, uh, so I think there was a ton of work in like 80s around on this topic again there has been a, a revamped or renewed interest in like you know between the 20 2015s around that time so basically there is a bunch of work which tries to build models that we can all look at print on a piece of paper look at them and see what the model is doing right so and these models are considered inherently interpretable of course i think there are also some caveats to that because if there is a regression model Model that is, you know, having coefficients or looking at about thousand features, it's very reasonable to argue whether that could even be considered interpretable because it's hard for a human to process thousand features and, you know, think about how they are all sort of relating to each other and what their importance is. But assuming that there are a handful of features or there are a handful of constructs such as rules in a tree or number of rules, uh, you know, assuming that then under that condition, these classes of models are often considered interpretable because end users can look at what are the important features, you know, how are the features being used and the conditions and so on easily, right? So the second uh, a category of approaches that has become a lot more popular in the recent past is to explain previously built models in a post hoc fashion. And what do I mean by that is, for example, we could have a very complex model like a deep neural net with several hundreds or thousands of intermediate layers, or a model that's a black box. That means we don't have any access to the internals of the model. We can just throw a data point at it and get an output from it. If we want to understand these kinds of models, the approach or the way to do it is we have this sort of an explainer algorithm which takes as input this kind of a black box or a complex model and breaks it down into several simpler models that you know are considered interpretable, right? So that's the approach that has become popular uh, since about 2015, 2016, right? Uh, oftentimes, whenever we come to that point and we discuss these two approaches, the question that comes up, in fact, in this 
area of trustworthy machine learning and explainability, this is almost considered a religious question as to which side you subscribe to, whether you want to build inherently interpretable models or post-hoc explanations. Uh, but thankfully, we don't have to resort to answering it uh, you know, in a religious way, because there are more logical arguments to picking one over the other, right? The reason even post hoc explanations became popular in the past decade or so is because of what is being shown in this picture, right? So this picture is just a pictorial representation of insights from different research papers. But increasingly, what we have been fi finding in machine learning research is that while models such as neural networks are very accurate, they're not very interpretable. And while models such as linear regression or shallow decision trees are very interpretable, they're not quite accurate, right? So there seems to be this kind of trade-off between interpretability and accuracy because of which post hoc explanations have become popular so that people can build a complex model that is accurate without worrying about its interpretability and then use post hoc methods to understand that complex model. Okay? Uh, so that's one reason why one would resort to using post hoc explanations is when there are trade offs in your setting between interpretability and accuracy. Right. The other reason why we might want to use post hoc explanations is we just don't even have access to a model, but we still want to understand, you know, what features the model is focusing on when making predictions. Right. In that case, obviously, we need to resort to using some post hoc probing methods. And, you know, that's another scenario where they might be useful. If you are not running into one of these two scenarios, then you might probably want to consider building a model that is inherently interpretable, right? So because you are not running into trade-offs between interpretability and accuracy, and your model is not a black box, you are not dealing with such a model. In such cases, you might at least consider or try building an inherently interpretable model, okay? All right. So uh, from here on, we'll be focusing on a very specific but a very popular class of post hoc explanation methods called feature attribution based local explanation methods. OK, so I'm going to ex explain each of the terms that uh, I just said right now and that are on the title of this slide. What do I mean by local explanations is the goal of these explanations is to explain individual predictions of any given classifier, right? So we are not talking about a complete description of the global classifier. We are talking about for a singular point, uh, the, the, let's say there is a model and on a singular point that model is generating a prediction, how to explain that singular prediction is what is the focus of a local post hoc explanation. OK, that's what we'll be looking at through majority of this talk. And these methods, methods in this. Stop you at the local. Uh... Just a, just a clarifying point on the local. Uh, so you mentioned that it's to explain one sort of model decision. Um, yeah. As opposed to what? What are the other sort of um, ways that are, let's say, non-local? Uh, or... Yeah. So uh, the other, like, let's say if you say, what is the other options other than local is, for instance, you could think of explaining the complete behavior of a given model. Right. So you, you're basically giving a full summary of how this model is behaving on different kinds of data instances. So that's called global explanations. And there is also somewhere like, you know, a granularity that's in between, which is called subgroup level explanations, which is about explaining model behavior on certain subgroups of individuals in the data. OK. And is like an example, an applied example of a, a global uh, look or global examination is say we're a bank, we're doing credit scoring, we have a possible new model that we want to roll out and we say, okay, we have our data set of 100,000 previous data points. This model tends to make a lot of decisions based on age uh, mm -hmm. in, in looking at predictions that it made for the existing data set. That's say one, uh, the, the global model look. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, thank you. you can, uh, okay. 
So uh, now this category of methods that is feature attribution based local explanation methods essentially output feature importances or feature attributions for individual instances. So what we mean is with each feature they associate some kind of an importance value that captures what is the effect or contribution of that feature on that singular prediction, right? Because as we were just discussing, we are focusing on explaining just one singular prediction uh, with these kinds of methods, okay? Uh, examples of such methods, uh, which several of you might have heard at least, some of these are methods such as lime, SHAP, gradient, gradient times input, smooth grad, integrated gradients, and many, many more, right? So those, those are typically the methods that uh, people consider as popular ones in this category. So I'm just going to give just, just one one point on uh, sorry to stop on, on the previous uh, slide to contrast the output feature attribution, uh, just to to provide the, the, a little bit of back end. So let's say I don't know we have a text we're doing sentiment analysis, um, not that it you know applies necessarily that closely to text. So the explanation that we want is based on just the inputs of the model. So which of the inputs in this instance uh led to that regardless of whatever else the model knows or stored in its parameters uh yeah yeah so all that these methods do is they try to give uh scores or weights to each of the input features whether that feature is a word in you know uh, some text that you have presented to the model or if we were talking about these examples of like the healthcare data and so on in that case the feature could be something like a symptom such as if somebody is coughing right so uh, it this these kinds of methods just place scores or weights on each of the input features which indicate how important that input feature is to the prediction that we are getting from the model Amazing. And these features can be, I don't know, if it's images, it can be pixels. If it's text, it can be words or tokens. If it's like tabular data, it can be just the fields or, or page. And in the context of images, this could be either uh, simple pixels or super pixels of images that have been, you know, constructed using other sort of image segmentation techniques. Like if, you know, there's an object detection that we have done previously, and if we can like just kind of flag out objects within an image, those also could be input features, right? Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about just one of these methods, the simplest of them all, to give some intuition about what exactly these kinds of feature attribution based local explanation methods try to do, right? Like, what is the intuition behind them? Uh, so one of the methods and the first one in this area is called line. And this method is actually does something very simple and intuitive. And I'm going to sort of describe a little bit about what that method is doing and then talk a little bit about why what it is doing might work, right? So what this method does is, uh, let's say if we were trying to explain the prediction of this point uh, in the sense that we want to identify what are the important input features contributing through the prediction of this point, the way this method suggests that we do that is we take that point and then we perturb that point slightly, which means we add some noise to that point and generate a bunch of different points around it. And then for all these points, we take the predictions of the underlying model whose prediction we are trying to explain in the first place. And then we fit a linear model, uh, which is like a linear regression, for example, or a logistic regression. We fit a linear model which basically predicts the underlying models labels on these points, right? So essentially what it is trying to do is create some sort of a local linear approximation of the underlying model, right? So that, that's what it is like intuitively trying to do, okay? Uh, so just to understand why a local linear approximation of an underlying model would be a good representative of what are the features the model is using or what it is doing on that point is because in spite so a lot of complexity with respect to model understanding 
stems from the fact that these models that we use today are becoming increasingly nonlinear, right? So for example, if in this picture, let's say this light blue region represents, uh, you know, the negative class and then the light pink region represents the positive class uh, according to the model, the way the model is creating the boundary. And as you can see, the boundary between these two classes is highly nonlinear, right? So you can see that this is like super nonlinear which means it's going to be some sort of a combination of like several nonlinear functions that is often hard to interpret for a human end user, right? But the hypothesis or the intuition that this paper, line paper is exploiting is that while a model can be highly nonlinear globally and therefore might be hard to explain, if you zoom in into a small local pocket of the model's decision boundary, it will behave like a linear model, right? So even if it is highly nonlinear at a high level, once you zoom in around this point, even that complex nonlinear model is we can fit a line there and try to separate the two classes locally, right? That mm -hmm. intuition is what this method and in fact, several other methods in this literature are trying to exploit. And so therefore they're like, okay, I'm going to take this point. I'm going to just like add some noise to this point and create a bunch of points around this point and then just fit a linear model uh, on those points and the predictions being made by the underlying model and that linear model and the weights it outputs will tell me how important each feature is uh, to this prediction, right? So that's the logic. Yeah. Just to clarify this figure, I, I think people who are who have a, a background in, in machine learning um, can directly sort of understand the space and what's happening. Yeah. But uh, am I correct in sort of explaining it to a more general audience to say, let's say we have a model that works with two features only. We plot those two features, they're at X and Y, say, I don't know, patient age and patient weight, for example, or blood pressure. Um, and then when we feed these to the model, the model would have would say this is a class A, this is a class B, class A, class B based on these points. And that's how we place these points. And uh, the plus or circle is what class that the model sort of assigned, assigned it to. Um, and the perturbation is to say, okay, if we have a data point like this, can we give the model the data points of a similar or let's say younger age or yeah. we explore that, that space there. And right. that concept is then, let's say, extrapolated to models with uh, a lot of different uh, classes and features, but just uh, a visual like this can be achieved by dimensionality reduction uh, down to two. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's pretty accurate. And uh, that's exactly what we are looking at even here, right? So this is like one class of points and then there's a different class of points, yeah. Amazing, very clear, thank you. All right, great. Okay, so with that background in mind, so essentially, you know, if you can sort of keep this in your mind that the kinds of methods we are thinking about from here on through the talk are basically the ones explaining a singular prediction and that explanation will just have weights associated with each of the input features, right? So that's, that's the space of explanations we are looking at. Uh, but now I'm going to discuss actually some of the challenges associated with these methods and how to go about sort of working through those challenges. The first is the disagreement problem, and I'm going to talk more in detail about that term itself. What do we mean by disagreement problem? But essentially, this is some of our recent research uh, where we did uh, a few studies to understand if and how these local feature attribution based explanation methods agree or disagree with each other in practice and what exactly constitutes disagreement between these explanations and how to formalize the notion of disagreement based on practitioner inputs and how do practitioners resolve disagreement if and when it occurs in practice, okay? Uh, so let me start by even talking about what exactly I refer to when I'm using the word explanation disagreement or the phrase explanation disagreement, right? So in fact, the way this study came about was that we were not sort of looking specifically to study the problem of these different methods disagreeing with each other, 
we just wanted to observe the workflow of practitioners that use these explanation methods in their day-to-day -day workflow and see what are the challenges we face, uh, they face, right? So we just wanted to do some interviews with them, observe how they're working with these tools, and then, you know, see what are the problems they face. And that's where we ran into this problem as one of the key challenges they grapple with on a daily basis, right? So what we did was a 30-minute semi-structured interview uh, with about 25 data scientists, uh, each individual data data scientists, a 30-minute semi-structured interview. Uh, and these data scientists were basically employees working in the explainable machine learning groups or explainable data science groups in the tech companies and also startups in the tech space. Uh, so we did like these interviews with them to understand like how they use these tools and what are the challenges they grapple with. In fact, the thing that sort of uh, stemmed right out of these conversations right in the beginning was that these participants started like talking about how they have this habit of running different explanation methods from this category to understand what are the features, input features driving each prediction. And they often saw them disagreeing with respect to very basic things. And what do I mean by that is they said that they often find that the top features according to these different methods uh, and the explanations they output turn out to be different, right? So for them, that's a rather simple question. If they ask a question of like, what are the top three features driving this prediction? Uh, they often see like Lime giving a different answer, Sharp giving a different answer, Gradient giving a different answer and so on. So according to them, that constitutes disagreement. And another thing that they often see happening is that the ordering among the top features is different. So for example, even if these explanations have similar top three features, which one is top one versus top two versus top three, that is often turning out to be different. And that's also a problem uh, and that constitutes disagreement. And then the third one, uh, which is again, something that a lot of these practitioners emphasized on was the direction of these feature contributions is different. And what do I mean by that? Is that, you know, while one explanation says that, let's say a feature like uh, salary is contributing positively to a prediction, another explanation puts a negative score on it saying that it contributes negatively to the prediction. Right. So the which direction, whether it's contributing positively or negatively, that also is different than there is disagreement. And the last one is if they're interested in, let's say, understanding they, they, they consider two features of importance, let's say salary and credit score. And if they want to understand which of this is more important uh, than the other when it comes to driving this prediction. And if one explanation says salary is more important, if the other one says credit score is more important, that's also a disagreement, right? So essentially, any of these not matching between two explanations output by two different algorithms is considered a disagreement, right? Uh, so interestingly, of course, while they're mentioning all these things as, you know, this is what constitutes disagreement, nobody was focusing on the precise feature importance values, right? Like nobody was saying, oh, Lime is giving an importance value or a score of 24.8 to salary feature, whereas SHAP is giving a score of 32.1. Uh, to the salary feature, why are those two score difference? Like nobody was raising that point. Uh, in fact, there seems to be sort of an implicit cognizance or understanding of the fact among these uh, practitioners uh, and 24 out of 25 participants actually say that explicitly that they understand that the feature importance values output by different explanation methods are not directly comparable. So in some sense, they understand that these methods are employing different techniques to come up with these feature importance scores. So they understand why the values are not precisely matching. But at the same time, despite that high level understanding, they want to make sure that some of the basic insights, such as what are the top three features driving this prediction, they want consistent answers from all these methods, right? Uh, otherwise, they don't see a point to having, you know, different methods just output a lot of different things and call them as feature importances. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we took all these insights from them. We took all these inputs from them. Uh, and in fact, like what we were just discussing is 
aptly or accurately summarized by this particular quote by one of the practitioners uh, who says that the values generated by different explanation methods are different. So I would not characterize disagreement based on that, but I would at least want the explanations, the output to give me consistent insights. The explanations should agree on what are the most important features, the ordering among them, and so on for me to derive consistent insights, but they don't. And that's the main problem uh, that they all expressed uh, their frustration, right? So we took all these inputs and insights and essentially put them in some formulaic form, like some kind of quantitative mathematical formula way. Uh, so essentially, we were just capturing what they literally said constitutes agreement or disagreement, right? So feature agreement was a metric which computes the fraction of the top K features that agree between two different explanations. Rank agreement is a metric that computes not only the fraction of features that agree in the top K between uh, two different explanations, but also where the precise rank of the features is matching. Uh, sign agreement is basically the fraction of the features that not only match or overlap between two different explanations, but also the sign, whether a feature is contributing positively or negatively, that also, that also should match. And then signed rank agreement is the strictest form of agreement where we are looking for in what a percentage of the features, a fraction of the features, uh, not only are they matching by being in the top K, but also their signs are matching and also their rank is matching within the top K, right? Uh, so this is just like sort of the, at the end, we are getting to the strictest form of agreement. And in addition, we also looked at and just comparing some metrics for comparing a, a given set of features of interest. Let's say if an end user is saying, I care about two input features, one is salary, one is credit score. I'm always going to look at like how these two stand in terms of their relative importance. If that is the kind of insight they're looking for, we have two metrics. One is the pairwise rank agreement, which basically, again, computes the fraction of these kinds of pairs in a given set of features where the relative ordering uh, is agreed upon between two explanations. Or we could also compute some sort of Spearman rank correlation coefficients over a set of features of interest, right? So these are just tabulating the different intuitions that uh, we have just discussed and putting them in some notation form, right? The reason why we were doing all of this was we then wanted to go back and run more exhaustive experiments and empirical analysis on different kinds of data, different types of models to see if these kinds of disagreements are prominently occurring. In fact, we carried out empirical analysis with six different postdoc explanation methods, four different real world data sets, some of which are tabular, textual, and comprised of image data, and eight different model classes, including some sequence to sequence models, uh, convolutional neural nets, vanilla neural nets, and so on, and you know regression models and trees and ensemble models like random forests. And across all these, like across the board, across all these different kinds of data, different model classes, we started observing these kinds of disagreements pretty consistently uh, among the different methods, right? So thus echoing or confirming what these practitioners were expressing to begin with, okay? Uh, then we went back and did another study to really understand how practitioners resolve disagreements when they occur in practice. So now that we are seeing these disagreements pop up everywhere, we wanted to understand how would a practitioner, when they are faced with two explanations that according to them disagree, which one would they pick and which method would they pick, right? And that's what we try to do with this study where we basically ask them, first of all, if these two explanations they were being shown, if they disagree or not, uh, and if so, why they think they disagree. And then once they say, okay, we believe these things disagree, then we ask them, which explanation would you rely on out of these two? And why would you choose that explanation, right? Uh, we did this study again with 25 users uh, where they were shown the screen that you just saw uh, the screenshot of. 
Uh, and what we found in terms of insights was actually more surprising and also somewhat more disappointing because we saw these practitioners picking one explanation or method over the other due to reasons like the following. The first is saying, oh, this paper or this methods paper has more theory than the other one. So maybe it's more rigorous. So we are going to choose that one, right? Or they would say, well, this is a more recent paper. So obviously they would have fixed some of the flaws with the other method. So I'm going to pick a more recent method. Or the second one is uh, these practitioners saying that this explanation is matching my own intuition better as to which features should be driving the prediction. So I'm going to pick that method, right? And the last category is some people were like considering methods like SHAP and LIME as more suited for tabular data and gradient based methods as more suited for, uh, you know, this kind of image data. So based on the data modality, they were almost sort of ad hocly making some of these decisions, right? But again, a lot of these are not well reasoned ways of choosing between different methods or their explanations, but they were just being employed as heuristics in order to decide which one to pick when there is a disagreement. And we saw a lot of people favoring kernel shap uh, and then smooth grad and then line and then integrated gradients in that order whenever there was a disagreement. Okay. Can I ask about, uh, so now I think you presented uh, two works or I'm not sure if it's, if it's the same one. So one is that, okay, there are a lot of methods. A lot of methods keep coming out. A lot of them have different intuitions or axioms that they try to do. So maybe one possible way to make a, a good method is not to invent a new one, but to aggregate them using some um, additional, let's say, um, intuitions on top, on top of them. Right. That's the first sort of... Uh, and was is that sort of connected to this uh, user study? So were the results... Uh, that are aggregated shown in that list of, uh, of of two bar charts presented in the other study, or was that just the raw? Uh, yeah, so that was just a raw, uh, you know, individual explanation method. So, so far we are not doing anything or communicating anything in these user studies that had any kind of aggregation. It's all individual methods and their explanations. Amazing. All right. Okay. So uh, just to sort of think broadly about what this study is saying and what are its implications is that feature attribution based local explanation methods are often disagreeing in practice with respect to some of the basic insights they are conveying, like even which are the top three features driving a prediction, right? And practitioners, unfortunately, are grappling with this problem a lot, but they're adopting ad hoc heuristics to resolve these kinds of disagreements, right? So that's what is happening. So now the question to think about is, uh, while at a high level, we all can see that these methods are probably using different techniques to get to these outputs, so they're kind of disagreeing. Can we have a more precise characterization of why these methods are actually disagreeing? And given that these methods are disagreeing, can we provide some recommendations about which methods to choose for different kinds of you know, scenarios and applications, right? So that was what was being addressed by our NeurIPS paper last year, uh, which was basically trying to adopt a theoretical or come up with a theoretical characterization of all the methods uh, from this class of feature attribution based local explanation methods. Essentially, at a very high level, what we showed was that these feature attribution methods are all performing local linear approximation of the underlying model. But the reason they differ is because they all adopt different loss functions and different notions of what a local neighborhood is, right? And we precisely showed what was the exact loss function each method was employing or what it can be reduced to. Uh, and the exact definition of the local neighborhood that they're employing, again, that we can mathematically show that this each technique can be reduced to, right? So that's why these methods are disagreeing, because while they're all trying to do a local linear approximation, their loss functions are different. Some are gradient matching losses, or there are squared errors. And then the notion of neighborhood they adopt is different. Like, for example, some are using a normal distribution when adding noise to a point, and they're 
adding uh, that you know sort of sample from the normal distribution some are multiplying that noise to a data point and considering other distributions like uniform and so on when creating the local neighborhood right and Again, at a very high level, we also had this no free lunch theorem in this paper, which actually shows that no single method can perform optimally well across all possible definitions of local neighborhoods in terms of recovering the underlying model, because they all use a particular notion of local neighborhood. They are all successful in their own definition of local neighborhood in terms of recovering the underlying model. No single method is going to work for all possible definitions of local neighborhoods, right? So with that said, then we would ask, I guess naturally one would ask a question, which method should we choose? Uh, one way to think about this question is have a guiding principle which says, choose a method which is likely to recover the underlying model when the model is a member of the explanation function class, right? So uh, we just said that a lot of these methods are fitting a local linear model. Now, if the model itself, the underlying model itself is locally linear, at least in that case, a method should recover that underlying local linear model perfectly. If so, we consider that to be a good method and we can like sort of rely on that. That could be one guiding principle. And basically what we showed was that in case of continuous data or continuous attributes, methods such as smooth grad, vanilla gradients, continuous version of line, integrated gradients and gradient times input, they all can recover the underlying linear model perfectly. And so in the case of continuous data, if we use these methods, we have a guarantee of recovering the underlying li local linear model. And if your data has binary attributes predominantly, in that case, using methods such as line, kernel shap, and occlusion, which basically employ a slightly different kind of noise function when generating the perturbations, they can recover the underlying local linear model if your data has binary valued attributes, which means zero and one, and continuous data is basically the sort of real valued attributes, right? So that was those were the results that were shown. And another way to approach this problem of which method should we choose is by having a comprehensive set of evaluation metrics that can give us some sort of like, you know, scoring or a way of comparing different explanations and their quality. And for this, we developed this framework called OpenXAI, which is an open source framework, and it will allow you to easily and readily compare different explanations and their quality. Uh, so essentially, we considered a bunch of about, I think, 27 metrics or so, uh, and we divided them into categories such as faithfulness of an explanation, which is how faithfully an explanation is capturing the behavior of the model, stability, which means if I add if I take a point x and then like just kind of shift it slightly how much will the explanation itself change uh, and then fairness which is how much is an explanation preserving the fairness aspects of the underlying model so we uh, sort of divided metrics uh, across these categories and then we can give scores or numbers for each explanation with respect to each of these. And obviously those explanations that rank highest on the metrics you care about can be used. And this is also a very practical way for practitioners to pick an explanation whenever there is a disagreement, right? And we also have some dashboards and which are also customizable to compare both new methods and existing methods uh, that try to produce feature importances for local explanations, okay? All right. So with that, I will probably spend just a few minutes talking about the next part of this talk, uh, which is natural language interfaces for model understanding. So now that we have seen there are these different methods, they all disagree, and there are some ways to sort of navigate through that disagreement, either by using reliable evaluation metrics or by relying on some of the theoretical results, which clearly show the conditions under which each method will recover the underlying linear model. Uh, so both of those can be employed when choosing a particular method for a context or an application, right? 
Now, coming to uh, Jay's earlier question of, okay, so it looks like there are lots of methods, you know, can we somehow get rid of this even question of like, which method should a user employ? Uh, can you just directly give me an answer that's likely to be correct? Do I really need to wade through all these methods or can you just combine them somehow, right? In fact, that's exactly what is being done by this latest work that we have. Uh, in addition to that, we are also trying to improve the usability aspects associated with understanding models. And all that is happening in this work. And I'll just start by first showing this uh, demo, which will give you some intuition about uh, what this tool is uh, like. So with this tool, you can literally chat with a model in natural language and try to converse with it and understand what predictions it's making and also the explanations for different kinds of predictions it is making, right? So in this case, when we say, could you please explain these predictions? It's saying that glucose, BMI, and age are the top three most important features that are driving the predictions of individuals whose, whose age is higher than 20, for instance, right? Uh, and so on. So the, this kind of interface, uh, which is both natural language a uh, conversation-like interface to understanding a model, but is also, as you can see, there is no more details about are you using Lime or SHAP or what's going on. It's doing a lot of that under the hood. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how it is doing that. Uh, and it's relieving the end user completely of the responsibility of picking a correct method and figuring out what is good and what is not, right? Okay, so we have just talked about all this, which is there are several explanation methods today, uh, and there are also several implementations of these methods and different libraries and so on, right? So it's a huge hodgepodge of a lot of different things, uh, which actually adds to the complexity. In fact, we did uh, a survey of different kinds of end users, such as healthcare workers, doctors, and policy researchers, and asked them about the challenges they face with explanation methods, and also what is the desiderata that they would like to see in this field going forward, right? And essentially what they told us is the following. So in some sense, they are puzzled by questions such as which explanation should you use, which method should you use, because there are several options and they just don't know which one to rely on, what to do. Again, going back to our disagreement problem that we were discussing. And then the second one is like, okay, if I pick a method, which implementation should I use? You know, is it one library versus other? And they again have, you know, very little idea as to how to approach that problem. And then the last one that they said was that uh, whenever they were running into these kinds of problems, they also had additional questions. A lot of times these methods would just provide a single explanation and they're done. Right, so they're like, here is feature importances and then we all move on. But typically these folks have follow-up questions they want to ask, maybe about another prediction or about you know, points that look like this instance that they were thinking about and so on. And again, there is very little that they have control over in terms of like asking those questions uh, because either they have to do that coding on their own or they have to rely on very specific libraries that may not be useful in other aspects and so on, right? So there are a lot of these kinds of challenges and they just felt like accessibility was one of the biggest issues when it comes to uh, them being able to use these explanations and understanding models, right? Okay. Uh, so, and this is where this idea of, in fact, one of the practitioners we interviewed in the study actually just had this anecdote of what if I could just talk to my model, right? So what if I could just, or what if you could just talk to your model? And that's where this idea came from to have this kind of an accessible, no code, natural language interface towards model understanding, right? Uh, and this talk to model, uh, which is the name of this tool that we built, has two parts to it. One is having this like language understanding engine, which takes the natural language inputs provided by the users. And then the other side is the ML explainability engine, which basically picks an appropriate method and explanation that is most reliable and then communicates that to the user again in an accessible format, right? 
Uh, so I'll give very brief overviews of what we are doing on each site uh, and then sort of show some more results. Uh, so essentially what we had was this kind of here is a user utterance and you know what the user is typing in. We have an underlying parsing model which sort of maps this utterance to some commands. Uh, which are like input commands or uh, the commands that will map it to specific explanation method. And then we get our output in the form of, oh, these are the important features that are driving the prediction, right? And the main thing that we were doing underlying this uh, is use language models in order to map these natural language utterances that users input to some kind of a parse or a command that we will internally use in order to generate an explanation, right? And the way we were doing it was essentially we had a bunch of training data that we created ourselves, which have this input utterance, which the users will provide, like the questions that they will ask. And then, you know, this kind of a parse, which maps it to uh, essentially commands that we can use internally. Uh, and then, you know, sort of like try and uh, fine tune a language model that can do this kind of mapping. Uh, in fact, we tried both in context learning as well as fine tuning and found that fine tuning is a lot more effective when it comes to the language model kind of mapping a user utterance in natural language to some sort of a command or an internal representation that we could use, right? Uh, so, in fact, a lot of these parses were straightforward to deal with, but the most important thing for us is to figure out which feature importance explanation to pick, right? So, we could always, for example, when an end user says, you know, explain predictions for people younger than 30, we can map it to something like explain this or a command that says explain, but which method would you use? And in order to sort of work around that problem, the way we deal with that is essentially look at this sort of a metric where uh, we compute these explanations from the different methods, for example, lime sharp, gradient based methods and so on. But then we compute this metric on each of the explanations where we take the feature importances like the top K features output by each of the methods we perturb those features and then see how much the model prediction changes. And basically an explanation where the change in the model prediction is highest, that is the best one, right? So let's say Lime says age and income are important, right? Sharp says income and debt are important. Now we take these and then in case of Lime's explanation, we take age and income of that data point and change the values or massage the values of that feature, th those features, and then see how much the prediction changes. Similarly, in case of Sharp's explanation, we take income and debt values uh, for that data point, massage those, and then see how much the prediction changes. Higher change means you have captured the important features correctly, right? So we were picking an explanation uh, for which this metric caused the highest change in the prediction. So that's essentially how we were automatically picking an explanation that is likely to be the most accurate, right? And we did a bunch of evaluations on this with like different domain experts in healthcare and also folks who work on machine learning, such as ML engineers in industry, as well as graduate students working on machine learning. And I'll just maybe give like one or two insights here, given that we are running a little bit short on time. What we found was that essentially this kind of, if we were asking these users to do some tasks, such as tell us what the model is predicting on a particular instance, or tell us if a model is likely to be correct in its prediction and so on, the accuracy on such tasks was much higher when participants were using uh, this talk to model tool versus another common dashboard uh, that is out there that's also considered a popular tool. And again, when we think about time spent for per question, uh, we see that the other tools were taking a lot more longer than the talk to model interface that we have. Right. Uh, so here is more details. And uh, Dylan, who is the first author of this paper and the student who led this work, has put up a nice website. Uh, so you can go look at the demos, code, and other things and play with it. Okay. All right. 
So with that, we are pretty much at the end of this talk. So uh, in this talk, we have seen several methods that were proposed to explain machine learning models in prior work. Uh, what we saw was that it's important to characterize these methods and understand which of them can be useful or harmful under what circumstances. In order to do that, uh, we were employing tools from theoretical analysis and quantitative metrics and user studies. And I think in general also, I think all these tools need to be used in order to determine the utility of different methods and understand how they relate to each other. And there is also a huge need for new methods as well as interfaces that can address the limitations of existing methods and tools. Uh, and more importantly, it's also very critical to bridge the gaps, whether it is understanding or communication or other gaps between researchers and practitioners. I think there are a lot of gaps in how a researcher would think of what a method is doing versus what a practitioner is expecting a method to do. I think a lot of conversations are important to have to bridge those gaps. And uh, in the end, I just want to sort of conclude by opening up this question on, so, so far we have been focusing a lot in terms of understanding or explaining supervised learning models, but now we are again suddenly in a different era or a new era of generative models and large pre-trained models. So how to go about interpreting them or understanding their behavior, that's like an open area where there are lots of interesting open research questions uh, and happy to talk about any of those and take more questions. I'll just leave you all with this slide, which has more resources on these topics. Thank you. That is amazing. Thank you so much, Hima. We have so many questions. I don't think we're going to be having time to go through all of them. I would uh, suggest everybody to post them in the Discord, and we can continue to have this discussion for the next few weeks as we sort of uh, uh, learn through that. We are at the top of the hour. Uh, all of the work you presented is absolutely fascinating. fascinating. And I'm super interested in things like talk to model as it's the really the intersection of three worlds. So everything that's really interesting in um, explainability, but also it's like grounded conversational agents uh, on high, let's say, risk scenarios and situations. Uh, also, you alluded to this, and I find it like to be a, a fascinating part of your work, which is the human computer interaction part of it. So how building robust machine learning models explainability is one item but another completely different one is seeing how people are using it what kinds of mistakes they're making what kinds of um, decisions they're making on top of it and i think we can spend an hour on each of these topics um and i'm really grateful for you to uh you know take us through this um thank you so much for for being with us um and uh yeah it, I invite everybody to uh, post their questions to um, the, the Discord, follow Hima on Twitter. Um, we'll be posting uh, her website and all of this work and talk to model in the Discord and in the YouTube. Um, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, Hima. I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining us today. This is the uh, conclusion of, uh, of this episode.